I grew up in Bayonne, New Jersey. My father came from Russia, so I was raised in a uh, Russian Orthodox atmosphere, which was difficult because we had to speak Russian to my father. Fortunately, my mother was born in New, in New Jersey, so we spoke English to her, so that helped. I was very active and my father kept insisting, read, study, read, study, sports will not get you anywhere because of your size. I realized that, but I loved it. When Charles Lindbergh crossed the ocean, I wanted to be a pilot. When I read about the fighter pilots, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And when Joe Lewis won his title, I wanted to be a boxer. It was all difficult for someone my size, but you have these dreams and you go along. Nicholas Oresko was a platoon leader with the 302nd Infantry during World War II. After being trained at Fort Jackson, he shipped out to Europe, where he would see combat in France and later in Germany. In January of 1945, the Allied forces were trying to take a German stronghold near Tettington, Germany, when Oresko's unit was ordered to the front line. Our job was to take the two machine guns that were on the side of the hill somewhere looking down at us. We couldn't see them, but they saw us. And every time we attacked, you would lose some people. So after two days of uh, battling and, uh, and with preparation with artillery and mortar fire, we decided the third day we would attack without preparation. We'd wait till it got started to get dark. It was January, it was cold and the snow was deep, and we thought we could sneak up on the machine guns that way. So I told my men, I said, tomorrow we attack at 4.30, no preparation, just be ready to sneak up on, on the enemy. Next day came 4.30, I said to my men, okay, let's go, move out. Nobody moved. I yelled again, come on, let's go. Again, nobody moved. And I felt so alone. I said, well, someone has to move, so I guess I'll just have to go by myself. So I looked up at the sky. I said, Lord, I know I'm going to die. Let's just make it fast, make it quick, because I know this is the end. And a cold wave came over me. You don't feel anything. You're numb. You're not in your right mind. You, you go by instinct. So I stepped out of the trenches and by myself, step by step, through the snow, and the Germans didn't see me. And little by little, I could see that my men, one by one, started to follow. But they were maybe 50 feet away. They, they were no help to me. So I was alone. Now, you can't imagine how it is to be alone in the battlefield with your men on the ground and the Germans in front of you. What do you do? You just keep plugging along step by step. And I, I'd say, well, if I give, have to die for my country, I'm ready. And then all hell broke loose somehow. All I know is there was a lot of screaming and yelling and shooting and firing. Apparently the first machine gun was knocked down, but I can't remember much about that. Only when I was wounded, then I came back to reality. I thought they missed me because my rifle belt and my clothing were full of bullet holes. And I said, they missed me, but I was on the ground. I was knocked down. But then as I started to walk, I could feel warm stuff coming down my leg. I was wounded seriously in the right hip. And then I knew I was wounded. And then it started to hurt. And of course, the more blood, the more blood I lost, and I was weaker, and, and so I was still alone. This is the important thing. And I kept trudging ahead, figuring, oh, well, I'm going to die anyway, so what difference does it make? And while I was crawling, my helmet uh, hit a wire, which I know was a booby trap. But because I was so low that the uh, shrapnel from the booby trap went over me instead of into me because I was so low to the ground. 
Then I thought, well, I better rest a while. So I saw a little indentation on the ground. So I went in there and rested. And I said, well, I think I'll just lay here a while. As I lay there, I could see right over me a flame of red and blue and purple coming out of the end of something, and it was the enemy's machine gun. They thought they had killed me, and they went back firing at my troops who were on the ground. Well, I couldn't go back because the, their guns would get me. I couldn't go forward because they were there, and apparently they thought they killed me that didn't see me, but I saw them. So I said, great, what I will do now is, is take one of my grenades out of my shirt and throw it in and finish the job, hopefully. Well, I reached in, the grenades are gone because I lost them as I was crawling. I mean, what else could happen? So I crawled back about 12 feet, I guess, and I found the grenades and put one in my shirt and, and crawled up to the same position. They were still firing at my men. I was just below them. So I said, all right, here we go. I counted to four. I pulled the pin, counted to four, threw it in, it exploded immediately, and jumped in after it, started shooting. Whom the grenade didn't get, the, uh, my rifle did, and then there was peace. It was so quiet, it was unbelievable. It was over. The guns were gone, and then my men came running up and helping me and patching me up and so on and so forth. Oresco was evacuated to the hospital and would eventually return to limited duty. However, in early August, to his surprise, he was told that he was going home and that he was to receive the Medal of Honor. My mother went to Washington with me, and my father was dead by that time. And I looked at my mother when the president waved to her, and I said, well, Mom, I hope this makes up for all my naughtiness when I was a young man, because <laughs> I think I was a pretty naughty young man. <laughs> my mother always told me, remember that in life, you can always do more than you think you can. And when I went in service and you see the medals on the walls or the pictures, I said, well, I'll, I'll never get that. I'll never get this one, I'll never get this one. But it, it, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. And you don't win it, as people say, you earn it. But once you're blessed with it, it's, it's, uh, you, you, you have it and your life changes completely. <laughs>